Okay, um, hello everyone and, and welcome to this philosophy and poetry seminar from the Department of English and Creative Writing at Lancaster. Um, my name is Niall Gildea and I teach English in the department and I'm delighted to welcome today uh, two poets, um, Christopher Norris and, but first, Owen Walls, whom, I, whom I'll introduce presently. Um, please can I just ask everybody else to, if you haven't already, and I think everybody has actually, but just to turn off your cameras and microphones for the duration of the two readings. Um, and you'll be able after the readings to uh, raise your hand uh, or type a question in the in the chat box um, uh, in order to uh, when we have a sort of 15, 20 minute Q&A. Um, so over the course of this hour, we'll hear from Owen and Chris about their recent work. Um, and finally, I should just re-emphasize that the seminar is being recorded, okay? Um, so first, uh, Owen Walls is a Derry poet. He's been the recipient of a number of awards, including the Eric Gregory, and his most recent collection, uh, uh, and sorry, an earlier collection, Pigeon Songs, was runner up for the Pigot Prize, Ireland's largest poetry prize. He also has a PhD in phenomenological poetics. <laughs> Oh, he did meta yin te ma meta yin te cafe to hati then yin te aspro. Anyway, anyway, that's still on a disposa vertical in a millisecond. Can you turn your mic off, please? Feel like yeah. Then be as it. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Right, so um. Owen also has a PhD in Phenomenological Poetics from Queen's University Belfast and his most recent publication uh, is Thought Poems, a translation of Heidegger's verse which he'll be discussing today. He lectures in creative writing at Lancaster where he lives with, in his word, a militia of daughters. Uh, Owen. Thanks very much um, and thanks everyone. John for uh, doing this, Niall for running it, Chris for reading with me, and um, everyone who's come, it's quite a lot of you. Wow. Um, here is the book, quite a monstrous tome. I thought you might, rather than seeing my face, you might want to see some of the poems on the page. Heidegger is widely known, if he's he is widely known as a philosopher, and people who know his poetry often talk about his poetry as very bad. Um, I don't think that's entirely accurate, <laughs> and thus I translated a lot of it. Um, I think it might be nice for you to see some of the German and some of the English. So I'm going to go through, I won't be able to see many of your questions now. I'm going to get my text up on screen, not for all of it, I'll smile at you now and again. But, oh, I beg your pardon, I'm just arranging. Oh, I've not lost that sheet, have I? Um, forgive me one instant. Here we go. I'm getting it on screen now. Here's the first poem I'm going to read. Here's the Heidegger's version. I won't read this one in German. I'll read this in English. Do you know of the hours that slow in the night? pauses in the night tides, when your soul surging life recedes and floods, and your fruit mad desires are drained of blood, hours where steadiness approaches, like in the last pages of a deep book, and where life's scale drunk variety spills itself like burning ceiling arches into the solitude securing duality between God and you. Hours that have no names, and rise before the husband's severe might, and her aerial view of the babe, and such softness quakes in you, like a lover's hand on your forehead. Hours like the nun's groans, like the shepherd's mute way home. Do you know of the hours that do not move? It's written in the early days of Heidegger, 2000, uh, 1913, not 2013. Um, and yes, you can see some elements that come through in his later verse. There is a tendency towards some abstraction, I guess it's fair to say, but there's some wonderful phrasing. I think many people would be surprised at the musicality 
of his verse. And there was some resistance indeed from Heidegger scholars towards this being presented as if we can do a collection of a philosopher that celebrates the musicality. And yet, to be honest, he wrote this in verse, as you'll hear when I read some in German, they are primarily musical constructions, not all, but very often it's the music and the sound of the language he is attending to. And I think to neglect that is to enforce an act of violence on a text. Um, now, of course, there's other reasons for being suspicious of Heidegger, and I think I would be remiss, or at least I might be called up if I didn't mention Heidegger's deep and nasty relationship with Nazism. And I know for many people that would be the end of the conversation. Um, I think that I can understand why. And I think it's fair that people are suspicious, but I don't think that can be the end of the conversation. And so when I translate his work, of course, I think I've got to be fully representative of any elements that I find there and not oversell them, not try to redress or adapt his work throughout the whole collection. Of course, I was trying to be as accurate and precise to his work, but accurate and precise while also being accurate and precise to the music of his verse. But um, I also felt I had to be precise to anything I found that at all could be anti-Semitic. And so another reader um, I shared the work with thought this poem had anti-Semitic tones and I can see where he's coming from. So I'm going to read it, not to celebrate it, but to warn you and to say that, yeah, these elements, while they're rare and it's often been talked about how Heidegger avoided for most of his life addressing um, those elements of his thought. And so that often many scholars felt they've had to look for them. I'd say it's not that they're not present. And so another scholar felt that this showed some anti-Semitic tendencies. The Faithless. You will not retain one more grain from your one-time authority, but perish barren in the bare exchange on the deck of lies, tricks and treachery. Some of the language in that was found to be darkly reminiscent of. And there's, um, here I've got, it's a commemoration for a boy who died for a soldier, young soldier who died in the German trenches. Yeah, I would say it's fair to say there are elements of German supremacism in this. I don't find it pervasive of the text, and I think there's more to be said of the text. Of course, some people don't manage to forgive those elements of his text, and I can understand that. But I think there is a lot more to be found there as well. Is it influenced by it? I would say it's impossible for it not to be influenced by it in some way. Is it pervasively influenced by it? I'd say there's a lot to say about it. And even if it was influenced by it, I think that's still a good reason to look at it still and read it. I don't think we should stop reading things, especially when the far right is on the rise and anti-Semitic texts are on the rise across Europe again. Sorry, my, my book copies. Maybe I'll stop reading them for a second. What I'd like to do, I'm sure many of you who come to Heidegger, many of you come to Heidegger at all, come to Heidegger for the philosophy. So let's look at one of his poems that is more philosophical and bent. Oh, my text is panicking. Um, I may have to read this one. I've got the page number here. I may have to read this one from the page because my electronic PDF is having a panic. So this poem is called The Dawn of Being. And if you want to see a new element of Heidegger's thought throughout his poems, he uses a lot of the poems to explore. He has his same preoccupations or his um, primordial relationships with being he wants to explore. And um, in this poem, for example, The Dawn of Being, ah, finally, my PDF has caught up with us. Um, we have an explication of his thought. If you're not used to German, you may not be used to how the first sentence here delays telling you the subject of the sentence until the very end. So here he's talking about the Greeks and how their perception of being, their response to being, even though it was at the primordial opening of being, prioritized vision 
as a way of responding to truth or a way of responding to reality, and that has influenced us ever since. The dawn of being. Cold into being, though first concealed, freed into the still restrained onset from the claiming, lacking faith in freeing itself, still long since hidden, yet once trusting the barely dared clearing of still obscure dispossession from the claiming, the Greeks are abandoned to their unique destiny. Free of the rise, exceptionally shy of the harvest, the gathering of all light into unobtrusive providence, and so first lightening a glimmer of light. Viewed from there, perceiving and compiling swelled as the viewpoint of seeing, which alone allowed them to choose the optical sense. And since then the world has worlded in appearance, as visual viewpoint presencing is. So now future being remains determined, giving forth the appearance of itself in constellations of thoughtless lights. In the measure of seeming self-exposure, recognition itself becomes catching sight, looking, entitlement to the appearance, bringing it forth in perpetuity of continuing presence, having forgotten its origins in the thinking of early hidden poetry in the poesy of being. The future itself failed in owning truth since then, a forswearing of itself only close with unfamiliar closeness to its own split. Sudden distances of nameless singles, after pure one time spared dispossession. Perhaps the light, if not quite the clearing of the poetry of claiming, will be the dawn that still hides, the free of this freedom, which itself is not the truth of being. Um, You'll see many elements there that run throughout the book. One is fair to say there's abstraction. And of course, this is often lauded. He, it is, it's fair to say he wants abstraction often. This, that's not the end of abstraction. And he still currently has, constantly has a music playing through a lot of the verse, but he does want abstraction. He describes what he does as build laws a dictum, build laws a dictum, imageless poetry writing poetry without images, which I would say is very risky, but it's an interesting experiment to write poems without images. But a lot of the time he does use images. And we'll look at some of them in a moment. But what you'll see here, a play in this poem, which is dense and perhaps is easier to read than to listen to. You see Auden's language. He constantly wants to strange it. And this is true in German, not just in English. I'm by no means with my translations be perfect. But what I have been faithful to, as well as rhyme, is his deliberate oddening of language. He wants it to sound strange in the ear. It's a deliberate technique he uses, commented on in by Germans, by native speakers. I had my translations um, vetted by a lot of native German speakers. And yeah, if I made something sound too normal, they tell me, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's odder in German than it is in English. And I have to, again, look at ways of reproducing his strangening of the language. But I'd love to look now at some of the musicality of his verse, because I think that's what people don't expect. They expect it to be very abstract. Now I'm going to read this one in German first. <clears throat> Listen to the density of rhymes. This is a small poem. It's quite a beautiful poem. He's talking about our turn, I guess, a twist that we make towards being, that turn when we go to think of existence in itself or being as a whole, but he does so through images, through small images of other kinds of twists that are similar to the twist he believes we need to turn towards being. I'll read it in German. Wende. Unscheinbare Wende, gleich dem lösen einverstandene Hände, Wende aus dem Fassen in das Lassen, Wende aus Besitzen ins Gehören, Wende, nahe den Blitzen, die zerstören wildes Toben, je die aufgesperrte Stille loben. Wende, und scheinbares Fügen, dass sich alles wende, rein, reines sich genügen, als ob nichts entschwende. Wende, des Ereignens spende. And now in English. Twist, unobtrusive twist, like when warm handshakes slip. Twist from grasped to unclasped. Twist from possession to belonging. Twist near lightning from the destruction of a wild ruckus to suddenly revere silence. Twist unobtrusive links where all finds itself purely sufficient as if nothing has left. 
twist the claiming's gift. The claiming there, one of his words for event or coming. He used the word ereignen, a very strange word to translate. He takes out, uh, I don't want to get too deep into the tectonics, but ereignis is a very common word for event, but for Heidegger it means also a taking possession of happening. Um, he has loads of beautiful smaller poems that touch, that are not as deeply abstract as much of his complex verse, and those run throughout the collection, and I think they're often quite beautiful. Here's one called The Day's Work of Thinking. I'll read this in German and English. Tagwerk des Denkens. Fugsamkeit der Fuge, eine Saga aus dem Sein. Langsamkeit der Pflüge, für die Sat auf Sternenschein. Einsamkeit der Hörten, einer unverjährten Pein. Pein. Tagwerk der Beerten, denen irre ungemein. In English. You'll see other common elements from his poetry, from a primordial stroke, pastoral stroke, ancient portrayal of humanity, and lots of handcrafts, lots of craft workers. He really liked the idea of working with your hands. Um, of course, he's been claimed now by a lot of eco poets, eco poetry. Many people like to read eco poetry into Heidegger. A day's work of thinking, deference of the joiner of one saga from being. Slowness of the tiller for sowing starlight seeds. Solitude of the shepherd of a pain without reprieve. Day's work of the bewildered, for them wildness extreme. Then there's lovely, really tactile poems too that go throughout his work here. I'll see if my PDF will panic when, no, my PDF survived, how wonderful. Um. I think this poem is just great. I think it's a lovely poem and it could have been written. Yeah, I'd happily read this anywhere now or a hundred years ago. The cabin in the evening. Far forest currents interflow, wandering the blue atmosphere. Symbols tug flights of swallows, unread in the air. One young yowl fades suddenly. Long stretched courtyards twilight into evening. The world grows free. Farmers hammer out their scythes. Stone flashes grey in the red. Wind seeps off into the quiet. Late light murmurs westwards. Will and mania sputter out. A slim deer draws to the spring. Over mountains the first starlight. Night hides its own brightening. Thinking settles, happy and shy. I think it's just gorgeous. I think, sorry, I know it's my translation I'm talking about there, but I mean the original as well. It just captures the images really quietly. If there's a pastoral twist to it, it's not a, unfair to write about nature, but there's an oddness to the language and an oddness to the phrasing that refreshes it, I feel. And that's mixed in with the abstract verse and mixed in with thoughts of with him writing about his thought. I think there's some wonderful ones he's written to Hannah Arendt, and I am aware of the time, so I'm not going to stay on too long. But let's look at one of the Hannah Arendt, of course, his Jewish lover, and who she forgave him quite famously. And I'm not suggesting we should all take that approach at all. But I find his love poems to her very touching. Um, oops, am I on the wrong page? Sorry. Oh, don't get lost in the page. I beg your pardon. OK, well, let me just type in another word. I should find it. Aha, Logos and Byways. Of course, I'm sure your ancient Greek is all better than mine. Um, but of course, as you know, that says Logos. Um, I guess word, sometimes reason it's translated as, or sometimes clearing. But here it just speaks of two lovers reading together and yearning for being outside. Logos and byways. In our fitting quietest life, as you read, why do you cry that high time is nearly past to walk the lovely laybys, your early set by byways in the forest? I mean, there's a musicality there, and I think you'll find the musicality in the English, or in the German too. Logos and Holzwege. 
wie den Ruf zu in dein Lesen, unser schicklich stillstes Wesen, das es lang bereitet bald, begehr, holde lege, deine früh gesparten Wege in den Wald. Um, I'm coming to the end and I don't want to run over into Chris's time, but so I'm just going to read two more um, and then I'll hand over. Oh, no, 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 damn it, here we go. Um, sorry, okay, let me check once again. Is this one for Publis? Look at that. It's another love poem to Hannah Arendt. Amo volo utsis. It's a sentence attributed, oh, if I remember correctly, I think it's a tri it's attributed to Aristotle. Um, forgive me if that's wrong. It's been a while since I've read this. I've got all my footnotes in the book. Um, it's attributed, it's supposed to mean, I love you. I want you to be. Um, and it's a poem he wrote to her, but it's got some of the most wonderful, weird words in it. Publis, jugglis. Um, here we go. That early on we told ourselves this shows what we have always missed, only lately hearing the summons to carry it through as a question, to finally read the truth in the world, so that you dwell in essence, what must I do? Sent off into the distance of unexploited instance, a secret harbours the word, suspicious, auspicious, in accord with stretching prayer, to sputter before the high flash, overshadowed, harrowed, smashed, where one ridge looms over the world, publis, jugless, without shoes, haunted the hurt, crying for home, as our steps climb where only one brave steps up, who has suffered long enough, so the law of the essence be his reading's commandment. I'll read one more and then I'll go. And this is, oh, sorry, 22. Um, OK, here it's in 21. Last poem, just like to say thanks again for everybody. Um, John, Niall, Chris, thanks very much. Somewhere a brook murmurs pensively in the night. Somewhere a young girl dreams away the hours then jerks upright. Somewhere there's a search like gloam in beaches and birches. Somewhere lies a discovery, the God drunk soul world overpowering. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Owen. That was yeah, fantastic. And um, yes, I've, I've got t tons of questions. Um, OK, so um, our second uh, speaker today is Christopher Norris. Uh, Christopher Norris is Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at Cardiff University. His academic publications over a highly distinguished career include books about literary theory, philosophy, music, politics, the history of ideas, and much else besides. In recent years, Chris has written and published several collections of poetry, including most recently uh, Hedgehogs, Verse Reflections after Derrida from last year, and uh, Damaged Life, Poems after Adorno's Minima Moralia, which is due out next month, I believe, through Utopos Publishing. Uh, Chris. Thanks. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, yes. Um, so I, I've been writing poetry for the last 10 years or so. And um, I think um, on a personal level, it was partly the prospect at that time fairly remote, but now real of retirement and the feeling that I didn't especially want to go on writing uh, conventional orthodox academic books and articles, but carried, wanted to carry on writing. Um, because it's a, a pretty fixed habit with me. And um, uh, going back to um, a, a form of writing I hadn't actually practiced for uh, many decades, uh, poetry. On the other hand, I, I couldn't sort of let drop all my philosophical interests or my literary theoretical interests. Um, so quite a lot of my poems um, for the first few years had to do with philosophers, philosophical themes and um, literary theoretical themes. And then increasingly with the last latest two books that uh, Niall mentioned just now. Um, they took the form of, um, of engagement with two thinkers, both of whom had uh, meant a lot to me over the years, um, Derrida and uh, Adorno. Two very different thinkers in many ways, as a matter of cultural tradition, philosophical background, 
style of writing and approach to philosophical issues, very different in those respects, but has something in common. Derrida's very acute, very probing uh, analyses of texts, um, remaining very close to the text in most cases, but raising significant, far-reaching philosophical problems. And Adorno's practice of negative dialectics, a kind of relentless, brooding, um, deeply analytic, analytic in the, the sort of larger sense of the word, not, uh, not that Adorno was in the, in the narrow sense, the parochial sense, an analytic philosopher, but he was a keenly analytic thinker and reader of texts. So there is something in common, quite a lot in common, between Derridean deconstruction, um, or deconstructions, as he insisted we should call them in the plural, and um, Adorno's practice of, um, yeah, of negative dialectics. Um, so the poems are in certain ways rather traditional. They are formal, even formalist poems. They rhyme, almost all of them, with a couple of um, exceptions. Um, they are written in um, fairly tightly constructed stanza forms, exploring, uh, well, quite a variety of forms, actually, villanelles and sonnets and, um, uh, well, you'll, you'll, you'll gather perhaps something of the range as I, as I go along. And the point throughout, really, is to engage with um, Derrida and Adorno, tease out further implications of their writing, look at it from different angles, use the verse form as a way of, if you like, expressing their thoughts differently. That will sound a crude sort of formulation, the idea that you can sort of hive off the form from the content, which is uh, and has long been definitely a sort of uh, a prohibited thought among literary theorists. But um, the idea that you can get a different angle, uh, that you can um, get at things in the text, in various texts of Derrida, but in Adorno's case, one text, one of his most um, acute and deeply personal, and at the same time, deeply philosophical text, Minima Moralia, a text which he wrote partly in Germany, partly in America, um, well, in, in America first, actually, during his exile, his enforced exile from the 1930s on. And then um, uh, when he got back to, to Germany um, after the war to resume his work with the Frankfurt Institute. Um, Minima Moralia is a very, in its way, a very poetic text, um, not in the same way that my poems are poetic. Um, in, in fact, one of the sticking points that I think many people have with these poems um, is that um, Adorno's interest and Derrida's interest was in a quite different form of poetry, modernist poetry, experimental, if you like, avant-garde poetry, but poetry that to a large extent broke with traditional forms. So you might think there's something rather perverse about my um, writing in traditional forms about two writers who were um, not especially interested in engaging such forms. So I'll just read the poems with brief commentaries, um, and I'll try to stick to short ones so far as I can. Uh, to begin with, some poems from the uh, the Derrida book, Hedgehogs. And I suppose the best, best way to begin is to read the title poem, um, Hedgehog. It, it was inspired by a short uh, prose essay by Derrida called, um, well, it originally appeared in Italian, but it's now available in English, um, um, hedgehog. Now, what is poetry? What is poetry? And he, he develops this image of the hedgehog, or the poem as a kind of hedgehog, um, rolled up into a ball, a kind of formal, self-protective, rather prickly ball, um, with immense powers of survival against enormous odds, like the odds of being crushed on the on the motorway, or the autoway, as Derrida has it, by a passing car. Um, so it's an extended comparison. Um, and so I'll read you the poem. I won't read you the long quote from Derrida's essay to begin with. A witness born, a signature event, inscribed and dated, yet required to take its chance with every comer, every phase of a reception history set to spill its inmost secrets, speak the cryptid name, or draw biographers to peek and pry. No autograph, no care to say what's meant, can save it from the next unlucky break. The poem hedgehog bound to spend its days in search of some dark hiding place, until night falls, and traffic, like unwanted fame, brings headlights streaked across a hostile sky. What refuge from the life threats they present, the scholar's slip, the copyist's mistake, the critic's faulty ear, or all the ways we find to smooth the hedgehog's bristling quill, or proffer theory nostrums fit to tame that prickly shape crouched at the next cat's eye? A nightly cull, a routine accident, like first drafts dug out for promotion's sake, 
lines garbled, clumsy shots at paraphrase, translations botched, and all those overkill techniques to deal with poems, lest they shame or prick the conscience of some driver by. So curious, too, the ways around they went to do it, like the hare that raced to shake the hedgehogs off, that pair of them who'd craze their panting pursuivant by standing still at start and finish lines, so he became in time the one to tire, collapse and die. Uh, it does go on rather longer than that, but um, I'll, I'll break it off there. Uh, it's, it's the, the rhymes might not have been uh, clearly audible, but uh, they're, they're six line stanzas uh, with six different rhyme sounds repeated from stanza to stanza. So it's a kind of gradual repeated pattern which builds up as it, as it goes along. Um, let me um, read a series of shorter poems. Uh, these are uh, sonnets um, and other short forms. Um, they are based on Derrida's later um, books, uh, a series of um, short books, well, short by Derridian standards, on themes like hospitality, forgiveness, the gift, and um, differ, or not differ not so much, autoimmunity. Um, and Derrida saw these as being um, paradoxical or aporetic, internally fissured, if you like, or self-contradictory concepts. Um, and he found this a very fruitful way of thinking about, among other things, ethical issues. Um, so the poems are um, intended to, to investigate the kind of apparatic logic that Derrida discovers at work in, in those words and to give it um, a different uh, form, look at it from a different angle. This one is called Hospitality. Um, there's a brief epigraph from Derrida's text on that topic. It's as though the laws, plural, of hospitality in marking limits, powers, rights and duties consisted in challenging and transgressing the law of hospitality, the one that would command that the new arrival be offered an unconditional welcome. That's what interests Derrida, this sort of uh, contradiction between the unconditional, absolute, unqualified application of a concept like hospitality and the strictly delimited, contextualized, um, restricted uh, sense of the word, which applies in practical circumstances. So is the poem. No hospitality where every guest receives a ready welcome. Every host extends full liberty to make the most of every privilege. And where the test is that he count no protocol transgressed by those who count his claim an empty boast, unless they get to carve the Sunday roast or bed his wife and daughter on request. No shame attached if every absolute comes hedged with rules or every open door you're welcome has restrictions framed to suit the time and place. Though purists may deplore such making do, and saintly types dispute such canny reckoning of the moral score. And here's one um, in a rather similar um, vein about forgiveness, another of these concepts, Derrida says, which suggests and perhaps relies on suggesting a kind of absolute conception of forgiveness, where you would forgive acts which were unforgivable, in any um, practical sense, things that were so terrible, so um, unforgivably uh, appalling that they would lie beyond the, the reach of forgiveness. And um, so he's saying it: the, the idea of forgiveness is animated. It is given its significance by this uh, sort of shadowy absolute that lies behind it. But all practical instances of forgiveness have to operate in a more restricted logic. To err is human, so the poet said, and followed up, but to forgive, divine. For gods alone it holds, his noble line, since human means mock godlike. If we're led to think forgiveness absolute instead of always having somehow to combine the tribute laid at that unearthly shrine with what gives humankind the go-ahead. Yet how speak of forgiveness if it goes no further than the guilt, rem the guilt remission due to equals, paid as debt or duty owes, and so forfends all thought we might outdo in grace or gratitude. God only knows what workings out of cost and revenue. And um, the last of these uh, short poems are the themes of these late short books by Derrida, The Gift. Um, this is a quote from um, a book of his called Given Time. For there to be a gift, there must be no reciprocity, return, exchange, counter gift or debt. For there to be a gift, it is necessary that the donee not give back, amortise or reimburse. This is um, a sestina, um, 
though like most of my um it's not Sestina, no, not at all. It's a uh, villanelle. Um it goes on slightly longer than a villanelle should. What's in our gift has naught of giving's grace. No gift but drives the donor to excess. Give faster, give big time, lest you lose face. Just trading gift for gift won't hold the pace when rivals are up trading more for less. What's in our gift has naught of giving's grace. Spend within means and you'll have quit the race. Just blow the lot, no time to second guess. Give faster, give big time, lest you lose face. That double entry stuff won't help your case when balanced books find no one to impress. What's in our gift has naught of giving's grace. Where spendthrifts speed, the thrifty must give chase or raise the stakes with all that they possess. Give faster, give big time, lest you lose face. Potlatch, not potluck. Here the winner's place is theirs who take most risk with least redress. What's in our gift has naught of giving's grace. Yet it's gifts offered in that hyperspace beyond all recompense that the gods bless. Give faster, give big time, lest you lose face. Then you'll give more than's good for you. Embrace the super irrigatory and stress. What's in our gift has naught of giving's grace. Give faster, give big time, lest you lose face. Um... I'll read, um, I must read really, because otherwise I'd be rather dodging the issue since Heidegger and Derrida are in question here. Um, the poem about Heidegger, uh, about Derrida's reading and Derrida's lifelong engagement with Heidegger, um, including the um, uh, the political issues um, that, that we've heard about already. Um, it's, uh, I should say that my, um, my poems are not Heideggerian, but they're very un-Heideggerian in a way. Um, they are, like Heidegger, um, very much concerned with language and with the truth dimension of language. Um, but they, if, if they take a lead from anyone's thinking about language, it's from the thinking of William Empson, especially a book of his, not his best known book, Seven Types of Ambiguity, which is a wonderful book about, uh, oh, almost the whole range of English poetry, really. But um, his book, The Structure of Complex Words, which I read early on, which left an immense impression. And these poems were partly written as a way of trying out Empson's analyses in that book, The Structure of Complex Words, um, as not a method for writing poetry, but an approach to writing poetry, which um, engaged with language at the, at the level that Empson describes there. It's a level of what he calls implied statements in words, the way that a single word can compact or encode or epitomize, contain within itself structurally as a kind of implicit semantic structure, um, whole complexities of meaning. It's neither he broaches in some types of ambiguity, but really works out in a very intensive theoretical form in this later book. Um, and one of the reasons I've stuck to rhyme and would make, um, you know, a, a principle of this in many ways, um, is that rhyme words can be used in a very complex functional way, not simply as decorative um, um, uh, forms of language, um, but as a way of um, um, structuring the poem and um, building on complications um, and in a way that I, th I think is closely related to what Derrida is doing in those late texts on concepts like forgiveness and um, um, uh, the other the other uh, topics I mentioned earlier. Yeah, so um, what I'm doing really is, is, is in a sense, the opposite of what Heidegger does. Heidegger broods in a very productive, very poetic um, way on the etymopoeic um, residues in words, on their early meanings, their history of meaning, in this constant questing back for some kind of truth, if you like, a primordial truth. Uh, that's there to be found in language if you quest back for its um, early usages. Um, what Emerson gives us is a way of thinking, thinking in and through complex words that I think can be um, promoted and intensified and explored in a very creative way through, uh, partly through rhyme and partly through um, various other forms of verbal patterning. Um, so this is the this is the um, poem about it's about Derrida's Heidegger, if you like. It's about Derrida's um, um, readings of Heidegger and the problems that Heidegger presented him with. A flat out use where mention once sufficed. 
Here does I seal its pact as quote marks fade. What choices resonate in that word geist? Till then he'd merely cited it or diced with portents like the Berlin motorcade. No need for use where mention once sufficed. Lip serve strange gods, placate the antichrist, stay safe and keep your trump card yet unplayed. What choices resonate in that word geist? The rectoral address it was that splashed your Dasein's Fraga to the boot brigade, a flat out use where mention once sufficed. Let's not think use of it alone enticed your thought, yet not ignore the role it played. What choices resonate in that word geist? Uh, you understand, this is Derrida speaking, by the way, I should have explained that at the beginning. So it's Derrida reflecting on his lifetime involvement with Heidegger's thought. No grab for power without its language heist. No putsch that fails to put some geistly grade shop talk to use where mention once sufficed. I fear it's when your language pincers slice those quote marks off, you called your spade a spade. What choices resonate in that word geist? A flat out use where mention once sufficed. You, this is the second part of the poem, Derrida speaking again. You cross me dear and your case haunts me still. Such depth with such depravity combined, it draws me back each time against my will. We few left Heideggerians must drill ourselves in your defence, although we find you cost us dear and your case haunts us still. Our adversaries say, how think to swill the poison out if it then leaves you blind to how he draws you back against your will? I say, Let's once more scan for good or ill those texts we've duly glossed and countersigned. He cost us dear and his case haunts us still. A pharmacon mixed cure and poison pill, that endless thankless task you left behind for us whom it draws back against our will. What if authentic Dasein should fulfil its own most quest, yet vitiate the mind? You cost us dear and your case haunts us still. See how it draws us back against our will. So I should move on to the um, Adorno poems now. Will you give me a warning, five minute warning, Niall, when I'm uh, five minutes off of my allotted time? Yeah, I mean, maybe if you if you could do about five minutes on the Adorno, would that be that be about yeah, right? Okay. Do you think? Yeah, yes, uh, that's fine. Um, yeah. It gives about 10 minutes for, for questions or something like that. If that yeah, that's yeah. it. Great. Yep, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. OK, I'll read a few short poems. Um, they all have uh, epigraphs from Minima Moralia, from the, um, uh, the Adorno book. Um, this is a short epigraph. The splinter in your eye is the best magnifying glass. Its truth's distorted form they magnify. No shard so small it leaves the optic clear. A gift, those splinters lodged in the mind's eye. Your views are error prone, but truth can't lie. Sight lines locate obstructions far or near. It's truth's distorted form they magnify. Light bends at speed, but these it can't get by. Wave blockers, moat or beam that interfere. A gift, those splinters lodged in the mind's eye. Thoughts optics tell us certain laws apply. No room for pleading just my viewpoint here. It's truth's distorted form they magnify. Trust lenses crazed or cracked to show us why things aren't and cannot be as they appear. A gift, those splinters lodged in the mind's eye. Take your first test results and then retry the test with splinter plus good optics gear. It's truth's distorted form they magnify. Those false beliefs you're eager to deny have their close analogue in vision sphere. A gift, those splinters lodged in the mind's eye. For that's what best enables thought to vie, sight primed with ideology's false steer. It's truth's distorted form they magnify. Let thought find out where sight lines went awry and vision compensate where mind tracks veer. A gift, those splinters lodged in the mind's eye. It's truth's distorted form they magnify. This one, um, it's called Invitation to the Dance, and that's also the name of the section of Minima Moralia. Life's good in spite of all, so Schiller said. An idiotic slogan, just what you'd expect from one who touted dreams long shared by stronger minds in his idealist brood. It's like the ersatz Freudian stuff they spread, those US shrinks. 
amongst the host of screwed up types who crave mere happiness instead of irksome truths to further blight their mood. Just ask me, where's that foolish fancy bread, that soothing ego trip that Freud eschewed? And I'll say, there within the adult head of every dupe, promiscuous or prude. No wonder they're so grievously misled, the witless Disney dreaming multitude, who think that if things just work out in bed, then they can quit the drink and comfort food. In truth, it's Freud's enlightenment they dread, his knowledge of that old, unceasing feud between the life and death drives, whose dark thread he traced through all the lives it snagged and skewed. The shrinks say, just cheer up, your demons fled, it's all those inhibitions you've accrued. Hang loose, take Schiller's joyous creed as read, and let id's death remind us not intrude. That's the promise to Bonheur, their drip fed. The dream that has those moviegoers wooed by screening just the ego-edited director's cut, all deathly thoughts tabooed. Yet, screed it as you may, you'll end up dead. The scene that haunts remembrance, though unviewed through all your Hollywood romances, wed to happy endings, dutifully cued. Far less, not more of them you need to shed, those inhibitions properly construed as lingering markers of truth long sped beyond the bounds of fake beatitude. It's by the pleasure-sniffing nose you're led, you blissed-out fools and ego-ticklers, who'd prefer that even Freud's harsh truths not shred distortion's veil, but see the lie renewed. I've got time for one more, Niall? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay, this is um, one of the few, I wouldn't say cheerful or optimistic, but um, redemptive passages. Now, you do get this in Adorno. He's mostly a relentlessly negative thinker. It's a matter of intellectual responsibility for him to think against the positive and not to um, give in to false dreams or ideological illusions. Um, but in the, the section called Finale, he does let in, well, more than a glimmer of light, really. No daybreak gleam this side of darkest night. What price redemption, if not black despair? Through rifts and crevices it leaps to sight, like last survivors sending up a flare. How shield against the messianic light? It's UVF, so exercise some care. Although such radiant prospects may invite exposure past all hope of cell repair. Perspectives must be fashioned, so you write to suit a landscape indigent and bare, yet in a darkness visible that might show new worlds set apart by just a hair. Let optimists pursue their facile flight like birds' wings beating feebly in thin air, while pessimists clued up on our bad plight may chance to glimpse the gleam beyond the glare. Hopes lost or hopes betrayed are those that blight all wishful thought of our entitled share, our future stake in happiness despite the skeptic's wariness, the cynic's snare. Leave just that room for hope, however slight, and see new rifts emerging in the clear obscure of scenes sun darkened at the height where reason sleeps through history's nightmare. Let heaven sent utopias requite the dreams of those with future faith to spare, who trust their promised bonheur despite the piled up wreckage lying everywhere. The lights fast vanishing, the chinks are tight, the signs ambiguous, the visions rare, and all the victims massing to indict the dream utopian in his armchair. Yet light may fall on history's black and white in lucid figurations like a prayer, redeemed, a chiaroscuro to excite a sense of hues unknown emergent there. No measuring finite against infinite, no way that scale so disparate might square until truth's dawn shows all things heteroclite now reconciled yet each beyond compare. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much, uh, Chris. Um, Owen, if you'd like to turn your camera and mic back on, um, you could you could join us. Um, so yeah, at this, uh, this um, point in the, the session, I'd just like to invite um, questions or comments from, from anyone who's here, and, and indeed Chris and Owen might have uh, questions um for one another so if you have a question please um raise your hand and i'll ask you to unmute yourself um and turn on your video if you'd like or you can ask it in the in the chat box charlie's got a comment in the chat bar you might want to talk to 
I'll just read the comment. There is a third, a poet who walks beside both Derrida and Heidegger, Paul Salan. I was thinking of Salan's visit to Heidegger, which led to his poem Tottenauberg, and also of Derrida's res um, various responses to his poetry, particularly Shibboleth. I wonder if either speaks any thoughts about how Salan relates to Heidegger and Derrida in terms of poetry, and as much as they each had a relationship with him. I, sorry. Hey, Beatrice. Um, any thoughts, Chris? I'm sorry, I missed that. I'm just trying to find the chat function. Oh, sorry. Um, Where is it? Um, but it's a question about um, okay, yeah. Salan in relation to Derrida. Aye, definitely. It was a very close and warm relationship between Salan and Heidegger. And uh, Salan was one of those few poets. Uh, Heidegger talks loads about poets. And sometimes when he talks about poets, he only means one poet. And a lot of the time that's Hölderlin. And sometimes it's also Salan. Um, and often when he's talking about the poet, he means specifically the poet in relation to the German people, uh, which isn't unproblematic, but often he's talking about poetry in, in relation to humans as well. But Salan was great. Salan managed to get attention for he, Heidegger, yeah, he wrote poems to Salan and indeed they swapped poems. So it's a, it's a wonderful relationship. I think it's really fruitful. And, but it was... Um, there's other poets sometimes I want to put Heidegger in conversation with. I'd love to see Heidegger with relation to Hopkins, for example. So it's great that there are poets that Heidegger did talk to and, and did debate with. And sometimes I can see other poets sitting overlapping or approaching similar themes. But with Slan, the relationship's definitely there, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, well, the thing that... Um... Derrida makes most of in Salan is, is the, the whole question of dating and particular occasions and circumstances and the fact that a poem almost, you know, aside from what it says and means, you know, in semantic interpretive terms, um, is, um, is witness. It is witness to a life, a life lived under certain circumstances, terrible circumstances in this case. And that was clearly important to Derrida, to Derrida in, a, in, in a very special way. I think... Um, Partly because he saw his own life and his own, the the history of his own thinking as being dated in that way, you know, not necessarily in big dramatic encounters, like his encounter with with Heidegger, um, but um, in what might seem almost mundane, um, mundane circumstantial ways, not the kind of thing that interpreters of poetry usually usually talk about, but certainly Derrida's writings on on Celan are extremely moving. Yeah. Mm. I mean, could I just ask you, and these, these are really, um, I, oh, John, actually, we'll, we'll hear from John first. You've got you, your hand up. No, you go first. I, I just had a couple of really factual questions, basically, about, um, so the first is, is Heidegger's poetry a career-long endeavour? The second is, did he ever publish any of the poetry, or was it all private, or were there instructions left for its publication? So they, they're two very naive questions, but they, they were something that I'd, I'd like to know a bit more about. Yeah, uh, it, it's really good. So, sorry, um, did he publish them? Yes, he published some of them in a small text called Gedactus, but with a small press. They weren't published along with this big press. I'll tell you what's interesting is that a lot of them, there was a career long thing. He wrote some of the poems I read were from the very start of his life and some of them he was editing towards the end of his life. He often used them to woo women. I think that's fair to say. And if you go through his papers, you'll see there's loads of naive or sweet love letters and love poems, not not love poems. The poems are often as dense or as philosophical as the material that we've looked at today, but they're dedicated or written to various lovers, Heidegger had through his life, which is fascinating, or of course to his wife. Um, what an interesting space. Why would the love poem and the philosoph the philosoph philosophy poem that isn't that weird? Why would you send them to a lover? I I know that's a traditional use of poetry and probably quite an efficient use of poetry, but I find it bizarre that he's sending often quite complex or you know, it's not standard. I praise you. Please come to the cinema with me. It's often much more complex or thoughtfully weird verse. Um, which is interesting that you choose to share that. Um, I don't know, I published them. He published a few of them, not loads of them. But I think he did send one to Salan. Sorry, if I looked like I was typing furiously, I'm trying to get my PDF to show. I think there's a preface to Totenauberg 
in the in the translations I've written. So it's just trying to get it up a bigger part and I wasn't checking Facebook. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll see if I can try to get that up. Right. Thank now. you. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Uh, John. Yeah, it's a very simple question and Jake, John, one for both of you. So maybe Chris first. Rhyming, what place does rhyming play in the think the thinking with which you're dealing? Um, you mean not not so much in my writing, but in the but in Derrida and um, Adorno? Oh, no, in yours. In mine. You, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. You were dealing with rhyme and superimposing it, as it were. What, yeah, what yeah. work are you doing, as it were? It's um, prompting thoughts, partly by getting myself sometimes into tight corners with complex rhyme schemes where um, I'm sort of pushed way beyond all the rhymes that come to mind in, in a readily associative sort of way and actually forced to go out on a limb and to use what looks on the face of it like an unpromising rhyme. But turns out, I think partly through the kinds of intraverbal mechanism that Derrida was talking about in that, that book I, I, I mentioned, um, to, to cast an int a new light on, on, on the topic to take me in, in unforeseen directions in a way that you wouldn't normally go in prose. You know, generally speaking, when you write a piece of prose, be it a critical essay or a philosophical um, article or, or whatever, um, then you know pretty much where you're going and language does pretty much what you want to do. You know, you may get occasional um, sort of unexpected inspirations or be deflected perhaps by uh, a new thought. Um, but um, with rhyme, you can actually put yourself in a position where you are forced or at least strongly led to explore new areas of um, vocabulary. No, not exactly vocabulary, of, of semantic implication. Um, yeah, so I, I'm really, I suppose I'd be happy to call my poetry rhyme led. I was, I was happy to find another poet actually, E.A. Stallings, um, saying, responding to the to the criticism that you often find in, in anti-formalist or free verse practitioners, sort of polemical free verses. Um, who would say, you know, rhyme is artificial and it's cramping and it's stilted and it forces you to say um, often trivial things, you know, which wouldn't, which are the very opposite of creative. And uh, she came up pretty forcefully um, against that line and said, on the contrary, she, she said. And for her, at least, and I'd agree with this, um, it um, it was the source of creativity rather than a way of cramping it. Um, Beyond that, I think, I mean, the um, whether you rhyme or not is, I suppose, is a matter of choice in a way. But with my, um, I don't know, I, it may even be partly genetic. My mother wrote rhyming verse, very different sort of poetry, actually, children's verse. But um, yeah, uh, so probably I was exposed to it early on in the book she would have chosen to read to me, you know, from Rupert Upward, <laughs> Rupert Bear. Um, yeah, I, I suppose rhyme sort of sank in, yeah, very deep early on. But I want to defend it beyond that in a more principled way and say that rhyme can be an exploratory instrument um, and can lead to sometimes in my experience quite, um, this sounds pompous, I don't mean it, that extraordinary, not in the sense of extraordinarily good, but extraordinarily unlikely, given the way the poem started. You know, you, you land up in unlikely areas. So that that's why I, I think it's deeply, it's what it's, I'd say rhyme is a part, as far as I'm concerned, a part of verse thinking, thinking in verse, in and through verse, so you couldn't do it in prose. I think um, rhyme, yeah, form does have that effect. It allows you to explore and control, and it can be, of course, a manipulative and evil force. It, it, can, it can lead you in garden paths, or it can lead to truth. I think Heidegger uses it as well to connect sounds and ideas also to play music while it's going on, which is a wonderful effect and to connect ideas. But yeah, the whole idea that form restricts language is not something I've found as a writer or in my translations. I find that form forces you to work harder to find out what you mean. And mm. it can definitely, I see with students all the time, I see in my own work all the time that it can force you down a dead alleyway. And that's something that you've got to be very cautious of, I think. That it can also force you to to really do weird things. I just thought back to the Suzanne question. I found here. I'm just going to flash it on the screen here. Like um, of there, Heidegger wrote and sent to Suzanne a forward to his poem Todd Nauberg. And so here it is. And um, yeah, I'll read it quickly. 
Yes, the hut and heights, to the spring of the sights out of gathered thinking, the book and the table, witnessing the joy of the guests. You have found me planning out the destination, the cabin, joy of youth for the children, later homesickness of trapped longing, our dwelling and hiking, refuge of renewed trust, the cabin, silence of world founded through you. It's quite lovely, quite touching. Um, sorry. No, thank you. Thanks, uh, Aaron. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments they'd like to raise at this stage? There's something in the. I wonder if Charlie says, I wonder if that's how Salan thought it went. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a strange episode, isn't it? I think Derrida writes about the Salan Heidegger encounter somewhere, doesn't he, Chris? In Cinders, I think. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, okay, brilliant. Um, okay, we're, we're just about um, out of time. If there are no uh, further questions, I don't see any hands up. Um, so, yeah, just on behalf of everyone here, I'm sure, uh, Owen and Chris, I'd just like to, to thank you so much for taking part in this seminar today and sharing your work and, and your thoughts on your work uh, with us all. Um, and thank you very much to everyone who, who attended today. And I'm sure there'll be information in due course as to the next um, the next seminar of this kind in the series. So, um, yeah, thank you all very much. And if again. people would like to turn on their mics and just give a round of applause, that would be uh, OK. Should we do that? Is that OK? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. 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 Yeah, there John and Niall. Yeah, thanks.